if you recall, last time we started learning about some shortcuts to finding the derivative of a function. In particular, the derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus one. We have a shortcut for finding the derivative of a power function. There's limitations here. If we want to, to use this shortcut, we have to write a sum of power functions. We saw on Wolfram Alpha that the derivative of a quotient is not just the quotient of the derivatives. Similarly, products, similarly, powers. We need other tools to deal with products, quotients, and powers. But if we can write a sum of power functions, then we get to use our shortcut. Fortunately, algebra is here to save us. We have the distributive property, and that, in many cases, will allow us to write a sum of power functions. Here's what we mean. In problem number seven, we've got the derivative of uh, 5x cubed plus 7x all over x squared. I didn't say that properly, but it's written. That's why I could say that. So if you're just kind of like listening, the words didn't match what's written here. What's written here is the quotient of the sum of 5x cubed and 7x and x squared. I think I said that right. So what we're going to do is use the distributive property to rewrite our function as a sum of power functions. I'm gonna distribute the x squared to both these terms. So there we have the distributive property. Both terms are being divided by x squared, so I'll distribute the x squared to each of the terms. Now I can write the two write two terms as power functions. Notice I still have the derivative because all I'm doing is some algebraic nonsense, algebraic sleight of hand. 5x cubed over x squared is 5x. 7x divided by x squared is 7x to the negative one. So we use the distributive property. Then we simplified. Now we have a sum of power functions. Once we have the sum of power functions, shortcut activate. The derivative of 5x to the 1 power is 5 times x to the 0 power, or just 5. The derivative of 7x to the negative 1 is negative 7x to the negative 2. Multiply by the exponent, subtract 1 from the exponent. Question. If we can write a sum of power functions, maybe we should. Maybe we should. If you use the quotient rule on this because you have secret mathematical knowledge, what you got will be the same as this when you simplify what you got. So it should simplify to five minus seven X to the negative two. If you wrote this as 
five minus seven over x squared and combine those two, you'll end up with five x squared minus seven over x squared. And that should be the simp another simplified form of your answer. How's everybody okay? If you're ever not sure, Wolfram Alpha will tell you. Type in five minus seven x to the negative two in Wolfram Alpha and it will say alternate forms. And then it does a little bit of algebraic manipulation. It says, do you like any of these? Because they're all equal. The same thing happens in problem number eight. I've got X minus three, but that's all being cubed. Some of you have secret chain rule knowledge and you'll just be like all oh, three times the square of the difference of X and three. Some of you just tried to take the derivative and tried some things on Wolfram Alpha and it said you were wrong. If we can write a sum of power functions, then maybe we should. So that's what we can, the strategy we can apply on problem number eight, which is once again, just the distributive property. So like all we have, is our shortcuts. Multiply by the exponents, subtract one from the exponents. So I'm gonna write this as a sum of power functions. So I'm gonna say this is the derivative of x cubed um, plus three times negative three times x squared plus three times negative three squared times x plus negative three p. I could write out three and start multiplying them, or I could know what the result is going to be. So I can apply some little binomial knowledge. One, three, three, one are my coefficients. Three, two, one, zero in the x, zero, one, two, three in the negative threes. Oops. So I even applied a shortcut on my distributive property. I still haven't taken the derivative. We're just doing some algebraic sleight of hand. Now we have a sum of power functions. And we can take the derivative a term at a time. We had a new thing show up in this problem. We had to take the derivative of a negative 81. There was no x. A few ways we can go about this. The derivative is supposed to tell us the slope of the line tangent to a function. The function y equals negative 81 is a horizontal line and the slope everywhere is zero. So the derivative of a constant is zero. We can also apply the shortcut because we could look at the negative 81 and think of it as negative 81 x to the zero power. x to the zero is equal to one. So we could think of this as negative 81 x to the zero power. So then we multiply by the exponents and we get zero. So it works out mechanically and it also works out if we when we think. So either way, that term contributes plus zero to the derivative. Great when things work out mechanically and when things work out with, uh, with the thinking behind it. 
this problem was even easier than the previous one. I didn't have to do that simplified terms. Actually, I did because of the way I wrote it out. But we just used the distributive property. We simplified the terms, and then applied the shortcuts. The way I got at my expanded polynomial without writing three copies of X minus three, I, you know some stuff about the binomial. This is a power. It's a power of a binomial. You wanna look up stuff about binomial. See also Pascal's triangle. Problem number nine is just a combination of the previous two problems. Oh no, it's even better because I got X minus three squared. So there I did remember to just make it a square. So nine is like a simpler version of eight combined with a seven. So nine is eight plus seven. So we're just going to try to write as a sum of power functions. I'm gonna multiply out the numerator, x squared minus six x plus nine divided by x. Then we're gonna continue using the distributive property. Now we can now we have a bunch of terms that we can simplify into power functions. So we x squared over x is x, six x over x is minus six. And then we're gonna write this as nine x to the negative one. How's everybody okay? Anyone worried that we jumped up in chapter three already? Class, don't you have to do everything in order? Well, you don't do everything in order anyway. There's a whole bunch of algebra that you just completely skipped over, and here you are in calculus. So don't worry about that. There's a whole bunch of trig functions that you haven't even heard of. I won't tell you about these trig functions because I can't actually name them. That's how important they must not be. Funny, everybody knows sine, cosine, and tangent. And usually we all know secant, cosecant, and cotangent. But really, out of those second three, if we just take secant, we'll be fine. Sine, cosine, and tangent, and of the next three, we grab secant. And then cosecant and cotangent, we're like, oh, yeah. Well, we got to have a complete set, so we'll put those in there. But there's a whole bunch of other trig functions that we don't need anymore, mainly because calculators have it. I'm pretty sure it happened in slide rules, but definitely since calculators. Oh, 
Kabbalah. We need to um, increase our number of shortcuts for things. So we're going to uh, introduce you to um, our next, the next phase of the shortcut business. Now I realize 3.1 is when powers, uh, uh, powers and polynomials, derivatives of powers and polynomials happens. And 3.4 is when the chain rule happens, but 3.4 is the next thing we need to do because secretly you've been using the chain rule all along. I guess if I'm telling you now, it's like not secret. It's not the chain root. If you're wondering why I could do so, why I should do such a cruel thing to you as to push you all the way into chapter three and then go right from 3.1 to 3.4 in such a cruel manner, it's better to have mechanics and thinking go on simultaneously. Because when we go back to start thinking about derivatives, the mechanics will be running in the background. When we come back to learn more techniques of finding derivatives, the thinking will be running in the background. And I'd rather just not wait for stuff to happen. We view math as happening in order, but it's kind of all happening all at once. So let's talk about the chain rule. So we have our shortcut for power functions, and we're going to start with this and use this to introduce the chain rule. Here's a power function with a base of x. The base of this power function is x. The chain rule is concerned with what happens if the base is something more complicated than x. What if instead of just x to the third, I've got something in parentheses like 2x to the fifth, all to the third? I want to find the derivative of not just an x to the third, but something to the third. And what if that something is like 2x to the fifth? Now we could apply our shortcut from before by writing this as a power function and say this is 8x to the 15th. And so the derivative will be 8 15, which is uh, 15, 30, 16, 120, 120 x to the 14th. We can do that just fine, but that's not what we're after today. We're going to use the chain rule. The chain rule says to do this. The derivative of something to the third is three times that thing to the second. Everybody recognize that one. That's just our shortcut. So the derivative of something to the third 
is three times that thing to the second. And that thing just stays as it is. The chain rule says, now multiply by the derivative of that thing. So on the outside, we'll say times, and what's the derivative of the two x to the fifth? 10 x to the fourth. That's the chain rule. The chain rule says multiply by the derivative of the inside. Yeah, this will all be 120 x to the 14th. Two squared is four, three times four is 12. 12 times 10 is the 120, x to the 14th. x to the fifth squared is x to the 10th, times x to the fourth, x to the 14th. So it gets us to the same place. So that's good. If it got us to a different place, then something is wrong. We can't just agree to disagree. In fact, as humans, we tend to agree to disagree way too often. Most of the time when you and your friends agree to disagree, one of you is wrong. One or more of you is wrong. Whenever I'm called in to adjudicate arguments, I say like, well, you're kind of both wrong. So the derivative of something to the third, so to summarize, if we want the derivative, we first look at the outside part three something squared. The derivative of something to the third is three times something squared. And then we multiply by the derivative of something. That's some highly technical formatting right there. There are a lot of different variations of words that you can put to this tune. I will teach you the ones that I learned. I'm gonna say that this something, I'm gonna to refer to that as the inside function. So I'm gonna to refer to the something as the inside. And then the to the third is going to be my outside function. So a lot of times this is referred to with an inside and an outside function. So this to the third is my outside function. So with this setup, we say take the derivative of the outside with respect to the inside. That's not a good way to phrase it. That's too technical. We say the derivative of the outside leaving the inside alone, then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Take the derivative of the outside with respect to the inside. That means leave the inside as it is. Take the derivative of the outside, leaving the inside as it is, then multiply by the derivative of the inside.
This is just describing what we're going to be doing in words. Take the derivative of the outside with respect to the inside, then multiply by the derivative of the inside. We might say we're looking at the, we're trying to find the derivative of f of g of x. Here we are taking the derivative of the outside with respect to the inside. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside. There's a statement of the chain rule that functions at the top. F prime of G of X, that's the derivative of the outside with respect to the inside, leaving the inside as it is, then multiply by the derivative of the inside. When the inside is just x, like when we had x to the third, then the derivative of the inside was one, and that's why we haven't been writing it. That's why it hasn't been an issue up to this point. If g of x is equal to one, then, oh, sorry, if g of x is equal to just plain old x, then g prime of x is equal to one. And so we didn't write it. We didn't say times the derivative of the inside because the derivative of the inside at this point was just always one. So we took the derivative of x to the third, not stuff to the third. Another way that we write this is with our Leibniz notation, which is just like the slope. When we think of slope of the derivative of y with respect to x, change in y divided by change in x, delta y over delta x. When we make delta y's infinitely small, we change the, de the capital deltas to lowercase d, and we say dy dx. This first term says df dg, And the second term, is the, sorry, the first factor is df dg, and the second factor is the derivative of g with respect to x. So here's another version of the chain rule. Take the derivative of f with respect to g, that's leaving g as is. It should match colors, right? It makes it more Christmassy. Eight. When everything was on whiteboards, I noticed that uh, I had I would typically bring the black, red, blue, and green pens. So black primary, red, blue, and green for emphasis. Then I noticed that. Um, I had a student that was sitting in the front row and they were taking notes with a black, a blue, a red, and a green pen. Oh, wow. And they were matching colors, even though I was kind of switching colors all kind of random. But they were always, they would color match the notes in their notebook to what I wrote on the board. I'm like, oh, wow. That's pretty, I didn't even have a word for it. But, being kind of a jerk the next day, 
I brought in some alternate color pens. I brought in a purple pen, an orange pen, and a brown pen. There's a brown pen. And I like pulled those out and put them on the desk. And he's like, oh, pfft, whatever. He held up the red pen, orange, held up the green pen, brown, held up the purple pen, blue. And I go, damn it, that's exactly what I would have done. That is exactly the correspondence that I would have made. So I brought all my pens following me. But he was a step ahead of me again. He showed up and I put all the pens down. And he said, oh. And he reached into his bag and pulled out an orange pen and pulled out a purple pen. I'm like, ooh. But then I pointed to the brown pen. And he's like, oh. Pulls out a pencil. I'm like, oh, damn it. You win this one. You get an A. You don't have to come back to class. You just get an A. Nice move. But it's kind of an illustration of um, it's an illustration of the things that you can do to recognize how you learn things. If you've seen how I teach things, how do you? Uh, but how do you understand things? For example, if I'm going to have rely on directions to get from point A to point B, yeah, I can put it into the GPS. But I'm going to be much less stressed. I have to look at the entire route visually before I can just hear the directions. Uh, some people are really good. They can just put it in the GPS and when the GPS says turn left, they're like, oh, nope, yep, yep. And they just follow along. I don't know how you do that. If that's how you use your GPS, you can just listen to what happens as you're going without knowing ahead of time what it's going to be, then I, that completely baffles me that people can do that. My wife can do it. If she's driving, she just puts it in the GPS and starts going. Michael, you didn't look at the you didn't look at the overall thing. She's like, oh, I can't look at a map and tell what's going to happen. I have to look at the overview that says it says okay, we're going to go over here, and then we're going to do one of these, and then we're going to go like this. I have to have that picture in my mind, otherwise the GPS is useless to me. It's nice to have the reminders, but if I didn't see it beforehand, it's going to be a disaster. I'll be driving along, turn right, Michael. What? What? Ah. Oh, but if I saw the overview beforehand, when it says turn right, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. We got to go one of these because we're in San Francisco. You can't make a left turn. You have to make three rights. You know what I mean? So if you can follow GPS instructions on the fly as you're driving along without having reviewed it beforehand, I should give you extra points because I cannot do that whatsoever. I have to like look at the picture. So I have that picture, that overall sketch, just a sketch of it in my mind. I don't need to know exactly where the turns are, but I have to know kind of the order of the turns. I have to have that picture. I can't recite it. I can't say it's a left, then a right, then a right, then a left. I can't say it out loud, but I can picture it in my mind. So I have, but I have to have that preload before the GPS constructions come at me. Anyway. Fortunately, GPS doesn't throw the data. It would be really funny if you go off course and a GPS instead of just recalculating. It's like, oh, <sighs> take the next left. I mean, it really should be that. And then they should get celebrities to do GPS. That would be amazing. Because I want Samuel L. Jackson to be doing it. Right. Turn right, MF. That would be amazing. All right, that's it for today. I will see you on tomorrow. We're going to practice this chain rule, even though we barely know anything about it. Everybody have a good day, and thanks for playing. Bye.